but what is going on? Because, uh, well, in the Times uh, yesterday, uh, they reported uh, yesterday morning uh, that Theresa May had told Donald Trump during a phone call uh, that Britain would need more evidence of suspected chemical attacks by the Assad regime uh, before joining a military strike. So the, the Times presenting it as if Britain would be joining in uh, with something which is being driven by the United States. Uh, but this doesn't seem to be the case because Theresa May has said, oh, we, she seems to be pulling back from it somewhat. We, we need more time. Uh, and yet, and all of a sudden, Donald Trump, uh, in fact, is backtracking as well. Uh, he says in a tweet, never said when an attack in Syria would take place. Well, he's got a very short memory because only 24 hours before that, he was saying that an attack was going to take place within 24, 48 hours. So uh, he gets instructions from Theresa May and suddenly he seems to be pulling back slightly. So I'm not quite clear what's going on. Uh, could be very soon or not so soon at all, he said. In any event, the United States under my administration has done a great job of ridding the region of ISIS. Uh, there's lots to criticize here. Uh, where is our thank you, America? Well, I don't think America needs one. Uh, so what? why would they be pulling back? Well, of course, deep skepticism from uh, the British public, from the American public. That's seen clearly through uh, social media. Uh, but also the Russian Ministry of Defense, uh, as we said on Tuesday's program, had been to the site. Uh, they've run soil tests from Duma, shown no trace of either sarin nor chlorine or any other chemical agent. Local hospitals have not received any patients with chemical poisoning symptoms. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Vanessa, we'll bring you in at this point. Welcome to the program. Uh, really, Britain and the United States in a bit of trouble here because no one believes them. Uh, and there's no evidence, it seems, although the OPCW uh, is on site, or at least they seem to be investigating. Mm, sorry, the, the sound is not great. You're cutting in and out. Um, I think what is very important to point out that in the last, I think, 24 hours, Syrian Arab repression and um, a number of, or the UN agency that's on the ground in Douma with the Syrian Arab repression have both actually denied the WHO report that has come out basically um, repeating what they've been told by the Violations Documentation Centre, which of course is another organisation financed and set up by Eamon Asbari and George Soros, um, similar funding and financing to the White Helmets, of course. Um, and so basically they've denied the WHO statement. They've said that there is no evidence of victims and that the hospitals um, have said that absolutely no patients came into them with any kind of um, chemical weapon attack poisoning. Um, and the Russian military have been walking around in the area with absolutely no precautions being taken. Soil samples are showing no residue of sarin or any other form of, of chlorine or other um, gas being used. Um, there, there's, uh, there's a bit of building work going on where you, where you are, Vanessa. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's not a lot I can do about um, it. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, look, uh, now let's, let's uh, discuss some of, the, uh, some of the things that you've seen. Because at the end of the day, what we're looking at is, is there any basis uh, for the... Uh, for the, the, the desire to, to start bombing Syria, and I don't believe that there is, but let's let's have a look at uh, at this image. Uh, just give us a background. I mean, what is this and where was it that you find it? Um, well, basically yesterday we went on to um, another visit to, to one of the liberated areas of Eastern Ghouta, and that incorporated um, an area very close to Kafrabadna, uh, which is where basically the Eastern Ghouta chemical or alleged chemical weapon attack happened in August 2013. This is an area called Zamalka. Um, we were taken into what was basically a munitions um, factory and a warehouse that was run by a number of terrorist organizations, but predominantly Nusra Front, Faik al Rahman, uh, Jaish al Islam. And in those centers, we saw the most extraordinary array of um, munitions, mines, even branded mines with Jaish al Islam printed, uh, you know, engraved onto the mines themselves. Um, huge number of rockets and missiles, many of them, again, we couldn't get very close to because of the booby trapping that still hasn't been um, attended to, probably by the Russian sappers who are going to be doing the job of demining these areas. Um, but also in one of these rooms, 
Um, there was what I can only describe as a large amount of um, blood on the walls. Um, we were told this was a room, not only had it been used as a munitions store room, um, but it had been used as a, as a torture room. Um, and in that same room, there were what I would call isolation cells, tiny um, prison chambers with a, with a grill window. That was their only way of seeing that. And basically, these munition factories and um, storerooms were connected by tunnels again. So we actually were able to walk underground and, and to um, walk from one area to the other, as we have been able to do in most of the areas of East Um So, what? what uh, it's, it's very hard to, to sort of. Uh, uh, get an idea of, of where this uh, leaves the British government's narrative when we start to see this more and more of this evidence coming out. Uh, and it, do, and, and, uh, uh, it doesn't just apply to, to munitions dumps and, and uh, torture going on. It's also about mm -hmm. the, uh, the recovery of, of people that are apparently uh, buried in rubble. Uh, and we have, yeah. uh, once again, another White Helmets video here. Uh, showing showing a child being recovered um but there are more and more allegations vanessa of of children being deliberately mm. buried in the first place is this what we're understanding is going on yeah i mean um what i'll do is just talk through um what i, I basically yesterday i ended up speaking to not only officials on the ground who are carrying out investigations into what was happening um during the occupation but also to civilians who um, lived under that occupation. Um, and in this instance, it was the officials that gave me the statement that in their view, based on the evidence given to them by the civilians living in that area, um, what was remarkable is when these children went missing from their families, um, it is believed that they were somehow um, drugged or anaesthetized and they were then used as props in the various false flag um, events that were staged by the White Helmets, but not only by the White Helmets, by a number of players, including the terrorist factions themselves. Um, and so what he basically told me, that this is the official um, who was talking to me about what he has gathered from all of the information he's been given by the civilians there is that the majority of civilians who lost children were unable to see those children before they were buried. Um, and so this intimates that these children were taken somehow from these families under certain circumstances. His belief is that they would wait for the Syrian jets to be overhead. Um, and then the people would run down to the basement. They would then cut the electricity, pour chlorine and similar into the area so people would start screaming. And then they would start filming. And at that point, the children would be taken, they would be anesthetized, and they would be then used as props in whatever event they were filming. Now, I have to stress, this is coming, um, this is coming from an official who was talking to me about what the work that the research work he had been doing so i still need to corroborate this with my own investigation but after this film that you're watching where we see the white helmets basically going immediately to the spot where the child is buried so there is no search for this child they seem to know exactly where the child is buried and as they remove the rubble from this child the child miraculously starts crying now, in any normal rescue situation, if this child had been buried genuinely under rubble, I don't think we would be hearing it crying the minute that it was released from that, from that grave, basically. So are we seeing at this point a child that had been previously drugged, pre-buried, and then uncovered in a, in a staged rescue operation? Now, this is all speculative, but based on what I heard yesterday, there is a very strong case that this is what is happening. And um, I think what is important, that, that the point that he made is one, that the parents who lost children were never able to see their children. In other words, they were not able to bury their children. They were told after the event that the children had died and had been buried in the graveyard. So these bodies were not seen by the parents. They were not allowed to attend any sort of funeral. So already, I mean, this is some kind of dreadful psychological warfare for these civilians, having already lost their children and then being deprived of seeing them before they died, before they were buried, sorry, and being able to prepare them for, for the funeral. Now, I also was introduced to um, 
another witness who had on the um, in August 2013, he'd lost five children. And I was able to actually speak to him and to try and piece together his story from that day. And of course, August 2013 was Obama's red line chemical attack. Um, now, what he told me, and I'm reading through the notes because I, I don't want to get any element of this um, wrong. I want to be able to transfer it exactly as he told me. Um, so on this day, he was sleeping with his wife and five children on the first floor of his house. I then asked him, um, was there any ventilation in this room? He told me, yes, there were windows in this room and many of them were broken. So there was perfect sort of air circulation in this room. He was sleeping there with five of his children. One daughter, who's now 19, was staying with other relatives, but in the area. They were woken um, by screams of chemical attack. But at this point, he told me that two days prior, there had been rumors of an imminent chemical weapon attack. He couldn't remember where those rumors came from, potentially from the terrorist factions that were there. At that point, so after he had woken up, he actually started to pass out. Um, and he said that he felt dizzy, he felt as if he was being affected um, by some kind of, of drug. Um, he was then unconscious for eight hours. His wife told him later that she had managed to keep conscious for at least 30 minutes and she had tried to keep the children conscious by putting water on their faces. But she passed out, as I said, after 30 minutes. After eight hours, they woke up in another place, in the hospital in Kafrabatna, but without their children. He then spent 36 hours searching for his children, and eventually he was told they were dead. So he went to Erbin Registration Center, which is in the same area, and he was shown a photo by the terrorist factions of three of his children, only three, two girls and a boy. Two girls are actually to this day still missing. His eldest daughter, his second eldest daughter, returned home from the relative where she'd been staying shortly after the incident. But she also suffered around 48 hours of nausea, headaches, and so on, which is what he and his wife also suffered when they came round after the eight hours of being unconscious. Um, he was told the children had been buried in Zamalka Cemetery before he was allowed to see them. And even to this day, he has no idea where they are buried or how they really died. He said to me there was no gas smell when he fell unconscious, but he did reiterate that after waking up, he felt sick and he had a headache. His surviving daughter, as I said, was sick for a good 48 hours after the attack. Um, but what is very interesting, the media at this time, I believe, claimed that over 1,400 children had died in Zamalka. But I was told yesterday by both civilians on the ground and also the officials there that only 50 to 100 families said they had lost children on that day. And I, I reiterate the word lost children because they have never seen those children again. Um, and in Ain Tarma, which is an area very close to where this incident happened, which this um, civilian um, witness was talking about, no families lost their family members at all. They didn't lose, none of them were affected by this alleged chemical weapon attack. And equally, even in his own building, the only civilians affected by this so-called attack were his family and two other civilians in that building. So why in this neighborhood, if, if this were a, a real bona fide chemical attack, are only specific civilians being affected by it? and majority children. Um, and so, you know, I think this bears out what I was being told, that somehow or other, these children are under certain circumstances being taken from their families, they're being put into a state of, of inertia, and then they are being used to, to stage these um, rescue missions or these false flag events that we've been seeing. Um, and. As I said, now, you know, obviously I need to, to be continuing with that research, but on the, based on the fact that we're, we're on the brink of war here, we're on the brink of Syria being attacked on the basis of what is effectively a complete non-event in Duma. I mean, of all the false flags that we've seen, Duma is in fact the, the most, for me, open and shut case of a total false flag event. Um, and we're seeing the emperor with no clothes, we're seeing the US administration, we're seeing the UN, we're seeing WHO, we're seeing the UK government and the media completely running with the story on absolutely no basis and no authenticity.
I mean, it's it's quite extraordinary. It's, it's weapons of mass destruction all over again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think it's important to get this information out. And while it is only at the moment based on testimony, but at the same time, it is based on documentation of the number of families who have not been able to attend the burial of their children, for example, um, on the fact that they know they, they don't even know how those children died. Um, they don't know where they're buried. Uh, boys and girls are being buried alongside each other, which in this culture is 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 really not acceptable. And it's very um, stressful, traumatizing for those parents to know that that is the case and not to be able to to recognize where those children are buried. Um, and another important point that was made to me in this particular area, Zamalka, the residents of that area were driven out of their apartment blocks and their homes um, and were replaced by European jihadists that were coming in or Islamists that were fighting then with Nusra Front predominantly. And out of those that have left this area now, Eastern Ghouta, to go to Idlib and then to Turkey and then back into Europe are over 280 British passports. So thank you very much, Theresa May. Um, we now have an influx of um, Nusra Front members heading back to their homes in Europe um, and to Britain. Thank you. Well, my silence says it all, Mike. It's <clears throat> absolutely horrific. It's shocking. But I'm going to say in many ways, not unexpected, because we know that even within UK, the British government has been prepared to lie and cover up and be involved uh, in the abuse of children. Uh, so for them to be supporting this vile abuse in Syria is not surprising to me, but we'll have to come in at, uh, on that topic another time. I think uh, Alex would just like a, an input here. Quickly, something that strikes me as the husband of a medic is that in amongst all the other British nefariousness here, British training, British funding, British equipment, uh, staggering amount that Vanessa was talking about on the US radio channel yesterday, and you've seen the pictures, uh, British passports, British propaganda, there may be British or other Western anaesthetists involved in breaking their Hippocratic oath in this situation. Of course, Syrians are some of the world's best doctors, both the Russian and Western trained ones, world's leading uh, experts in many cases. But anaesthesia is an extremely complicated and skillful branch of medicine. And uh, for this to, the amount of targeted anaesthesia to be uh, applied, it implies to me as an intelligent layman looking at medicine that there are some Western uh, or Western trained doctors up to some very evil things there. Mm. Yeah. 